Praise God, we've been waiting on you. We're ready to get into a new subject tonight. Well, it's not a new subject, but it's a tape that we must upgrade. The old tape uh, just about played out. So we're going to talk about the three world ages. There's no way that a Christian or anyone else can understand the Word of God except they be aware of the foundation. You can never build upon anything without a good and solid foundation. It has a great deal to do with the creation. Now, we have in our nation and the world, as far as that's concerned at this time, the great controversy over, well, was it evolution or was it creation? And the thought by most is that due to the influence of, uh, no doubt, the Kenites upon our public school systems as well as other things, that we must teach evolution, which anyone in the science community knows is a lie. That is, if they're a true scientist. Uh, I mean, you've got a few uh, woodpeckers out there still yet, but every species on record, I I'm giving you a cold, hard fact. Every species on record, whether you find them in a dig dating recent or ancient, they're the same. They have not advanced one iota. Small marine life from the Ice Age is exactly like the small marine life of this day. You can still find them. No change. And evolution itself must be an unending process. Or it's a lie. In other words, you would have to be able to look out your window today and see species in every stage of evolution. For it, must, it would have to be an ongoing process. Well, that's obvious. Uh, you don't see it. Why? Because it's a lie. It's all a big lie. And as I said, those in the scientific community that have any knowledge, you've got a lot of people in that community that do not have knowledge. They're void of knowledge. Uh, they like to dream in the boom boom land or something and have lost touch with reality. What I'm stating is hard, cold facts. Nothing has changed and no one can prove otherwise. So isn't it time that we put that theory to bed, though we're forced to teach it to our children, just quite simply tell them that there are certain bureaucrats that like to teach lies because they lean so far left that they're confused, and give them the truth. What we're about to study is the truth, the foundation of this world. Our Father created it, He spoke, and nothing became everything. You know, our Father does all things in a natural sense. And when you look aside from nature, then you lose contact with our Father. Okay, if we were to say then that the age we are presently in, which most ministers teach, that the world was created about 6,000 years ago, then we're teaching contrary to God's Word. God's Word states that this earth is it's eons in age. We do the documentary on the dinosaur tracks. Billions, millions of years ago, they're placed there. I mean, it's obvious they're there. That is a fact. And yet you have some Bible thumpers that will say, the Word of God states that this earth is 6,000 years old. It doesn't. I challenge anyone to document that God's Word states this earth is 6,000 years old. It doesn't. It says quite the contrary. It says even that there was an age before this earth age. Same earth, same heaven, different age. And many things happened in that age. And they are written in our Father's Word. I want to start this, if I may, in Psalms 104. Psalms 104, where we are in 
the beginning. Let's go with it. Psalms 104, verse 1. Rest easy with this subject. As we go along, it will solidify for you. Bless the Lord, O my soul, O Lord my God. Thou art very great. Thou art clothed with honor and majesty. He is honest, but in his majestic sense, he can do whatever he so chooses. Two, who coverest thyself with light as with a garment. He is the light. Who stretcheth out the heavens like a curtain. He created the heavens. Three. Who layeth the beams of his chambers in the waters. Who maketh the clouds his chariot. Yes, those chariots spoken of in Ezekiel chapter 1. On which his very throne was transported. A very natural sense. When you understand the nature of things. The vehicles. You might say, well, we today couldn't create such a vehicle. No, but they were in the world it was, and they are in the heaven even at this time. And it was in those same vehicles, no doubt, that the fallen angels came in in Genesis 6. There's no doubt about it. There, there are traces on this earth, facts, documents, in Central America, landing fields, directions given and recorded by the ancients as to their being, all right? His clouds, his chariot, who walketh upon the wings of the wind. Do you understand what that means? Who can walk in the spirit, which is the wind, hurak. We in this flesh do not see that dimension necessarily unless God so chooses. Verse 4. Who maketh his angels, that is to say his messengers, those that convey messages, spirits. He makes them as the wind, the Rurak. His ministers a flaming fire. Now, I have a work done on ministers of fire. And within them, you understand why God chose some before the foundation of this earth age which was approximately 6,000 years ago, but only the foundation of this age. That's why it's written in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4. I chose you before the foundation of this earth, this age. How could he do that? Because we were his children even then. Where does your soul come from? Well, um, it comes from God. That's exactly what I mean. Would you mean I lived before? Well, you just answered it yourself. You came from God. You were with Him. And we will discover the great overthrow at the foundation of this earth age. What caused it? And then you'll begin to understand your Father's Word in more depth, in more clarity. And you will understand better then the ministers of fire who are God's elect, the kings and queens, of this earth age, that they earn the right to be called elect. All right, verse 5. Who laid the foundations of the earth. This goes back millions of years ago. That it should not be removed forever. The ages will change, the cosmos, but never the terra firma, never the eruts. It shall, that's to say the soil, it shall stay the same. Uh, that is to say, the earth in its proper orbit. You know, we've done enough space travel, even as human beings, that is to say, vehicular, that we're beginning to look around and see by the other planets that this is a very special planet indeed. He, God placed it here in this proper orbit. He hung it here because of the climate, Yes, and even the perfect climate before the overthrow, when the earth was shielded with the, with, um, the firmament, that special solution. He left a bit of the firmament, and we call it the ozone. And it dissipates because of pollution. But the firmament was, that was there originally was a firmament that would even stop aging. Verse 6. 
Thou coverest it with the deep as with a garment. The water stood above the mountains. Now what, what it's saying here, God created the earth and the earth stood out of the water as it is written in other places. But because of the tuhu vabuhu, you'll learn that term before we finish this lecture and the next, the one that will follow. It means the earth became void and without form, not that it was created void and without form. Why did it become void and without form? Because of Satan's first rebellion. Within the Greek, you have a verb, kabuli, in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4. You'll find it again in that great seed uh, uh, chapter in Matthew chapter 13, where God said these mysteries were hidden, Christ rather, said these mysteries were hidden before the kabul, the overthrow of Satan and the world. I'm going to teach you of that overthrow. Oh, it's documented. You'll, you'll find it. Let it flow for the moment. I will document everything I say from my Father's Word so that you may know and understand the creation and why we're even in this earth age. Why did God destroy the age that was? That is recorded in Revelation chapter 12. In the very opening verses of the chapter, it covers a long period of time. It goes back to the world that was when the old dragon with the same political structure that he will use in the very near future, deceived one-third of God's children called the stars, the souls that were there, the souls that he sent, born innocent of woman, to choose this time. Will you still follow the one that led astray in the world that was? Or will you follow Christ? Will you love your Father? For it was for that reason... I, in my own opinion, believe that God destroyed the earth age whereby he would not have to destroy his children. You know, it takes quite a bit to destroy one of your own children. He sentenced Satan to death. But here in this earth age, he gives everyone a fair start. They are born innocent with all memory of the world that was erased Oh, I think occasionally one of God's elect for a fleeting moment see a place or a thing or a condition and, and I think that the mind itself strains to recognize or to recall and that strange feeling of I've been here before, this has happened before comes over them. I think it goes far deeper than most might think. But for that reason, it is God's will that all we come to repentance and believe upon him whereby he does not destroy them in that great lake of fire before we go into the third earth age, which is eternal. And there will be nothing there that offends. All right, let's continue on. Verse 7. At thy rebuke they fled. Those waters fled instantly. Not the year it took, as recorded in Genesis, for Noah's little flood to depart. But instantly the waters fled at the voice of thy thunder. They hasted away. Instant recovery. You know, anyone that walks through the country sees a cutaway in a railroad or you're driving down a highway and you see layer after layer. Here, Even here in the state of Arkansas, as you've all heard me describe before, where our native stone is either limestone, sandstone, or flint. And you find seashells that have been dropped out through this area from the Ice Age in the layers. Yes, seashells. Not our country rock or common rock. Why? How did that happen? You know when you understand God's plan. The kabob, the overthrow. No, Noah's flood, the water slowly receded. After the Kabul, as God spoke, the Spirit moved upon the waters and they fled away. And there was dry land, Genesis chapter 1, after the Kabul. Verse 8, They go up by the mountains, and they go down by the valleys unto the place which thou hast founded for them. In other words, as you form this particular age, 
Many believe that before the overthrow of the Cabell, that earth was all one solid mass and that it split with, with the Americas drifting away from Africa's. Uh, in other words, the shape will definitely uh, aligns to that, but be that as it may, another subject for another time. But it did move, but he placed the boundaries then. Verse 9, Thou hast set a bound that they may not pass over the coast of this great nation, that they turn not again to cover the earth. He has promised that he will never destroy the earth again by water. That promise was, and rededication was made certainly at the time of Noah's flood. We're going to go to the New Testament. Peter spoke of these things. If they seem foreign to you, you simply haven't studied God's Word. Second Peter chapter 3. We go there at this time to carry through on this thought where Peter has one chapter dedicated to the three world ages. Did you know that? Well, then listen to it as we study our Father's Word. Chapter 3 and verse 1, 2 Peter. This second epistle, beloved, and the first was written to the elect, and he's writing this second to the same people, documenting and identifying who it is addressed to, whereby you better understand. I now write unto you, in both which I stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance. I want your memory to be shaken back even to that world that was, if it be possible, that you know and understand God is in control. Time meaning nothing with Him, but that time would come. I want to stir your minds and cause you to remember, verse 2, that you may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets. I want you to be aware of those words spoken by the prophets of the Old Testament and of the commandments of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior. That is to say of the Gospels, that is to say of the New Testament. The prophets of old, especially the psalm we just finished, Psalms 104, was a prophecy by David. David was a prophet. It is declared in Acts chapter 2 that David was a prophet. You may have never considered him so, but he was. And yes, the apostles, Paul especially, the writer of a large portion of the New Testament spoke of this mystery over and over. And yet most people do not know. Why? Well, we'll find out here in a moment. Three. Knowing this first, that they shall come in the last days, that there shall come in the last days, scoffers walking after their own lust. This is mockers or... Um, and saying, this is what those mockers and uh, scoffers will say, where is the promise of his coming? Where is your second advent? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. Nothing has ever changed. Everything's the same. There is no God, perhaps, and certainly he's not coming. Have you ever heard that? It will especially wax worse and worse in these end times. Verse 5. For this they willingly. What's that word? For this they willingly. They request it. They desire. They willingly are ignorant of that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out, underline it in your mind, out of the water and in the water. In other words, there was an age before this, and people are willingly ignorant of that because they don't want to be accountable for knowledge. They don't want to understand the plan of God. Most churches today cop out and say, all you have to do is believe. Believe what, friend? Believe in Antichrist? That's what they're leading you to. If they teach a rapture theory, leading you straight to worship Antichrist, the first uh, Messiah that comes. He's a fake. He's a false Messiah. 
that the earth was of old. In other words, there was an age before this standing out of the water, not as you read in Genesis chapter 1. After it became void, there was nothing standing out of the water, and God ordered the waters to hasten away after he destroyed that earth age, and it became habitable again. Well, isn't he talking about Noah's flood? No way, friend. No way. God totally, completely destroyed every being in the kaboom. I'll document that in the next lecture. Verse 6. Whereby the world that then was, being overflowed with water, perished. Do you know what perished means? Everything of that age perished. Through Noah's flood, many people lived through it. I do not believe myself that the flood was worldwide, but that it simply covered the place where the Nephilim had impregnated the daughters of Adam, trying to prevent the birth of Christ, a Satan's attack. Genesis chapter 6, it's written. Anyone can read it that doesn't willingly wish to be ignorant. And God destroyed those hybrids, whereby the line through Noah was perfect, and the Christ child could come of woman. All of them, though, in the Kabo, that's to say, in the world that was, perished. That means there were no more. Seven, but the heavens and the earth which are now. Do you think Noah's flood destroyed the heaven that was? Well, that's what it's saying here. The heaven was destroyed. Naturally, Noah's flood did not destroy the heaven, but the Kabo did. But it was the heaven age that was destroyed. It's still the same heaven. It's still the same earth. Now, we come to the second. But the heavens uh, and the earth which are now, that's to say the second earth age and the second heavenly age, by the same word, what word? God's word. By the same word are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. What does this perdition mean? That word perished, same thing. Those that shall perish, that God shall destroy. Even now, they are held in reserve. Even the fallen angels that are held with Michael that shall be cast out, they shall die, those 7,000, when the two witnesses rise from the street of Jerusalem. It is written. Now really think for me. Sharpen up. Verse 8. And beloved, be not ignorant. Please, do not be ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. Now, how many days was it that God was creating the earth? Seven days. Six days, rather, He created, and He rested the seventh. We're almost at the end of the 6,000 year period. That's true in this earth age. Then what comes? The seventh day, which is what? The day of rest, which is what? Is the millennium. Don't be ignorant of that fact. Many wonder why the dinosaur bones from, and the uh, mammoth bones from the world that was as we go to Alaska there's one even in this studio at this time. I've showed it to you before and shared it with you. That great bone that was found by people that I personally am familiar with. And the meat was still cooked on the bone of that mammoth or, or off the bone and fed to the dogs. And they ate it with buttercups still in their mouth. Preserved that good under that frozen tundra. What happened in one quick instant that froze everything instantly? And it all dates back about 14,000 years ago. Almost 13, 14,000. Even that in itself shows that great change of weather that would instantly freeze and preserve these mammoths. And there they are today. What, what are you going to say about them if you say the earth is only 6,000 years old? It's no wonder that we lose all trials 
because the courts will not let one with intelligence witness. First off, they do not recognize the word of God as fact, and you can't use it. But even with documentation that is present now, that this chapel works to produce one each month that preserves truth and puts together documentaries whereby when the next case comes along, that we will be able to use those facts in a Christian way to document and fight the theory of evolution, which is a lie. God's word is really quite simple. It is man that tries to make it difficult. Verse 9. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise. If God promises you something, he's not slack about it. You can count on it. As some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward. He suffers long with us. That means he's patient, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. This day that we're speaking of prior, of perishing and perdition, it isn't God's will that anybody perish. It wasn't God's will that Satan even perish. But Satan chose because of his actions that our father, and I'm sure much to his grief, had to sentence that one to death. Well, does that mean that if it's God's will, all will be saved? No. No. It is written also that many will fail. That God would like for them to. After all, they are his children. But they will not all make it. It is another way of saying he wishes that all own their own. Now many right here are going to say, well, God's all powerful. Why can't he do that? And you've heard me explain it many times. But I feel this is the time to do it again. There is one thing that God will not do and I might even add further, cannot do. He cannot create souls for his pleasure, his company, and force them to love him and have it be true love. You cannot force true love. You cannot force true love from your own mate. It's, I, it, love generates from within each entity, and only the entity his or herself has the ability to create that love. It's a very natural thing. So God, if he were to force someone to love him, it would be fake love. And friend, he doesn't want your fake love. You don't con him for a minute. Therefore, it is his wish that all love him. If you love Satan and his ways and the ways of man, then go to hell. They'll go to the pit and they will perish. But it's not his choice. It's yours. Verse 10. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. That means it will surprise as a thief always does. In the which the heavens um, shall pass away. The heaven that was, the heaven that is now. That is why heavens plural. Will pass away with a great noise. And the elements. Translate the word rudiments. Translate the word evil rudiments. Shall melt with fervent heat the earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. And many say, well, that's the atomic holocaust and they know not of what they speak. There's nothing. It's everything but an atomic holocaust. Our father is a consuming fire. He does not say that the earth itself will be destroyed. He says the rudiments, the evilness, the wickedness will all be burned away. And there will be nothing but righteousness left. Though our righteousness be as filthy rags. It is the evil things that shall melt away. That is why it is written that on the first day of the millennium every knee shall bow. Verse 11. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved... That's the wickedness, the evilness. What manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversations and godliness? Um, what should you be um, uh, prepared for? You should be mentally prepared for it. That's what you need to be thinking about. 
That's where you need to be putting your conversations, is preparing yourself mentally by understanding the word that is spoken that brings these things to pass, to see that you please your Father, and as it is His will that you love Him, and are, come to repentance and are saved, that you accomplish it. But you've got to do it on your own. You can't listen to the traditions of men. They don't teach in that depth. It isn't popular. Verse 12. Looking for and hastening unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens, being on fire, shall be dissolved. And the elements, again, what are they? The rudiments, the evil rudiments, shall melt with fervent heat. Why? The last verse of Hebrews chapter 12. God is a consuming fire. His Shekinah glory. And His love warms your heart. It's called the Holy Spirit, the Comforter. But to the wickedness, it will burn them at that time. God loves you. He doesn't want to hurt you. 13, nevertheless, we, according to His promise, look for new heavens and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. Now, a lot of people say, we're going to a different place. This one will be destroyed. And they don't understand Greek. This earth will be rejuvenated. It's a new earth age and a new heaven age. It's the third. The third, as Peter so adequately brings forth. See that you understand the end and the changing of the ages. We're going to run over with teaching a little bit. I want to finish this chapter. 14. Wherefore, beloved, seeing that you look for such things, be diligent that you may be found of him in peace without spot and blameless. Dear one, our spot is not the spot of the Kenite. Our spot that makes us spotless is wanting to please him, to love him, coming to repentance, teaching his word, standing for him, not the rudiments. Come out of the rudiments. Many teach rudiments in the name of Christ, coming in his name, when they are not with him. And they know not of what they speak. Know your Father's Word. Mentally prepare yourself by understanding the Word yourself. 15. And account that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation. Because He's willing to be patient and wait. That each entity has an opportunity to love Him or Satan. Even as our beloved brother Paul. Also according to the wisdom given unto him. Hath written unto you. Here Peter gives credentials to Paul. Many would like to strip Paul of his credentials. Even that great fisherman gives Paul credentials by the wisdom in which Paul taught. You see, Paul taught on three levels, and most people can't handle that, nor do they comprehend it. They may, they may comprehend one level, but not the mystery that Paul spoke in and taught on these three levels of the three world ages. 16. As also in all his epistles, whose? Paul, most of the New Testament, speaking in them of those things in which are some things hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest. They, they can't understand it. They, they, don't, they don't know the books of the Bible, much less where they're located. The thing that is most valuable to them, they are most ignorant about. It's a shame. A love letter written from our Father to each of His children. And most have not read it with understanding. As they do also the other scriptures. They can't handle them. Unto their own destruction. It will destroy you if you don't begin to prepare yourself mentally for that that is about to come. It's that simple. It's your choice. That's what this age is all about. You make your own bed, you're going to sleep right in her, friend. 17. Ye therefore, beloved, seeing ye know these things before, you knew them before, we talked about them before, beware, lest ye also, being led away with the error of the wicked, the rudiments, fall from your own steadfastness. See that you don't lose. It's real easy to be deceived by the false messiah at the very end of this age. 18. But grow in grace. What is grace? Grace is that 
wonderful gift God gives us, a gift that you don't deserve, unmerited favor of God when you try. That's why your mind opens and you begin to remember better when you pray to Him to give you knowledge and understanding because of His grace. And in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, to Him be glory both now and forever. Amen. This earth, in its rejuvenated form, our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. There will always be that heaven, and there will always be this earth. God, God's throne is heaven. It's coming to this earth. That's why the description and the shape of heaven is described, or that city, new city is 1,500 miles into space. A cube, in other words. Because it is coming to this earth. This earth shall always be inhabited. The description given in Revelation chapter 21 states in the Greek, not that this earth is new, but renewed. A better English word, rejuvenated. Made fit to live upon. It shall be done, and it shall come to pass. Where will you be, dear one? Forever and eternity, simply for trying. That's all you have to do, is to commit to the best of your ability that you will try to know and understand and learn of your Father's letter. To understand those things that have been, whereby you understand that our Father is just. He doesn't burn people. For no reason. He doesn't hurt people for no reason. All things that he does are just and fair and righteous. It's like in the last lecture, you noted we had a letter or a call that wanted to know why 70,000 people had to also pay for David's sin. No, they didn't pay for David's sin. They paid for their own because they had committed a like sin worthy of death. And God killed them. He took them from this earth age. For what reason? For hate? No. For chastisement whereby others would see and fear and begin to follow the commandments of the living God. God is totally, completely fair. If, it ever, if you ever understand something in a position in or a light that it may appear that God is not fair, you are in error. Read longer, study harder, look deeper. And you will always see our Father of love as He smiles down upon you, willing that you come to repentance. Can you repent? All you have to do is say, Father, help me. I repent, and I want you. I don't want death. Do it. Do it today. Won't you do that? Okay, God bless you. Listen a moment, please. Praise God, we've been waiting on you. We're ready to get back into the three world ages. You know, it takes a great deal sometimes to descramble. You know, the scrambler is quite a thing anymore, but it takes a great deal sometimes to unscramble or descramble input into your mind over a period of years from would be Bible teachers, Sunday school teachers, or what have you. And they're well meaning, bless their hearts, we love them. But it can sure make fools out of Christians when you must on your faith stand and say this earth is only 6,000 years old when God's word declares it, but yet some Bible thumper has you declaring that and, and the, the scientific community snickers and it's no wonder that they do. They should. Because only a fool would make a statement like that because God's word in itself through Peter's teachings that we covered in the last lecture, the three earth ages, we're going to complete this lecture on the three world ages because it's really not that complicated when you listen to your father's word rather than man. I'm going to teach you in the second verse we read a Hebrew word. I don't want you to ever forget it. It's important. And where do you go to get the truth? The beginning. What does the word beginning mean? Genesis. So go to Genesis chapter 1. Verse 1, may we ask a word of wisdom from our Father in Yeshua's name as we go into his word. Bearing in mind the words of Peter, listen how it tells right here in the first two verses 
a span of history that is eons, millions of years. Listen to it. Chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, period. Now, when did it say he did that? It didn't. It said, in the beginning, he created the heaven and the earth, period. It doesn't say there's no time involved in that other than the beginning. Now, when was that beginning? And after he created the heaven and the earth and to be inhabited, what happened to it? You know of Satan's rebellion. You know of the great shaking before even the foundations of this earth. Now listen to this second verse. Even in the English, listen to it. Verse 2. And the earth was without form and void. Underline the word void. I'm going to give it to you in the Hebrew, and I don't want you to ever forget it. And darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. The Spirit of God had moved on it before this. The word void, tuhu, in the Hebrew tongue, means absolutely, utterly, completely waste, void, destroyed. So what does it really say here? It says that in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth, period. There was an entire age in that first verse. And then, if you were to translate the word was, became, you would have it. And the earth became void and without form. And darkness was upon the face of the deep. Why? Because God destroyed that earth age. There was a time before this destruction that all of the children of God sang and were happy. They were joyful. It's written in the 8th chapter of Proverbs in another place we will study before we complete this lecture in this setting. And then unhappiness came on the scene. Sorrow, greed on Satan's part. It's written in Ezekiel 28. It's just that people will not listen to our Father's word. They listen to men. And dark clouds did form on the horizon as Satan who is called Tyre in that chapter, meaning rock, not our rock, the fake. He began to try to take over the mercy seat, which was reserved for Messiah. And he himself was condemned to death. So death did not enter this earth with Abel. Death did not enter this earth with Adam and Eve's sin. Death entered this earth with Satan in the world that was. Now, true enough, death entered this earth age. But you, you've got to realize there is a difference when you say this earth and then put perimeters there, parameters, and focus only on this particular age. That's what's wrong with most Christians. That's why that we have evolution taught in our schools because Christians are not wise enough to really understand the creation. And scientifically, you can document the fact that this earth is millions of years old. We do it in our own documentaries with the dinosaur tracks and so forth. But God's Word declares it as eons old as well. It's just that Christians just seem to be a little bit slow. Why? They allow the ministry to place those parameters at the beginning of this earth age and the end of this earth age, and that's all they can see. They can't see past that. They can't see before it or after it, even in the prophecy, because they have not been taught. Now, God goes into a great deal of... Uh, of um, he goes into a great detail as to how He destroyed the earth, and it's well written in Jeremiah chapter 4. Let's go right there. Jeremiah chapter 4. We're going to move around a little bit in this lecture, but be that as it may, if you listen, allow your mind to be washed clean rather than brainwashed, all right? 
Let it be washed clean with the truth from God's word, from those things that have been instilled within you. What's happening here in Jeremiah chapter 4? Well, here in Jeremiah chapter 4, God is giving Israel a great warning. He's t telling you in one case how you should break up your fallow ground to plant seeds. And those seeds happen to be flesh man, for one. The Passover tapes this year will lead into that. Those of you that have studied them will know and understand what I mean. But he said, if you mess around, I'm gonna, if you don't think I will destroy this earth age, look what I did to the last one. That's what he's talking about. So here you have a first-hand account not from man, but from God himself, as to how he brought about the destruction of the earth age that was. You read here how the earth came to be void and without form. It wasn't that way always. The, uh, let, me, let me go to a little data for you. The fact on the documentary we made in the panhandle of Oklahoma in the edge of Colorado, the fact that there were rich legumes at one time, almost swampland with the very dinos the dinosaur tracks millions of years before, letting you know that this earth was not void and without form past that 6,000 years ago, but that it became that way. Those dinosaurs and that rich legume that even brings about and brings forth the oil that you and, and fuel that you burn in your automobile did not happen 6,000 years ago, nor did it happen underneath uh, water. That is to say, an earth covered with water and void of anything. The dinosaurs were there. They are something. So you see, there's a great hole in what man would teach you that this earth is 6,000 years old. Be realistic. Christianity is a reality. So face it. It's not a religion. It's a reality. And understanding our Father's Word is a reality also. Listen to Him and you'll learn. So He's telling them, if you were listen, if you don't think I destroyed it once before, listen to me. Let's pick it up, if we may, in verse uh, 19. My bowels, my bowels, my within, my within, or my heart, my heart, if you like. I am pained at my very heart. My heart maketh a noise in me. I cannot hold my peace, because thou hast heard, O my soul, the sound of the trumpet, the alarm of war. And those of you in a prophetic sense, if you look all the way to the end, you understand when this next destruction comes, in part. Verse 20. Destruction, yes, at the seventh trump. Destruction upon destruction is cried. For the whole land is spoiled. Suddenly are my tent spoiled and my curtains in a moment. In other words, it's going to happen again in an instant like that. A moment. When? When Christ's feet touched the Mount of Olives. And now he's going to tell you how it happened in the past. Listen carefully. How long shall I see the standard and hear the sound of the trumpet? The standard, of course, is Yeshua Messiah, Jesus the Christ. He is the living word, and the word is your standard. Verse 22. For my people is foolish. What, a, what an understatement, quite frankly. When you think in the terms of what he's trying to communicate to you. My people are foolish. They stand up in a court of law when the evolution, the monkey law, comes forth. And they don't have any more sense than to say this earth is 6,000 years old. They have not known me. Why have they not known God? Because this is His Word. And they don't know that Word. They are sottish children. Do you know what the word sottish? They, the translators of the King James were very kind it means stupid in the Hebrew. They are stupid children. And that, that explains it more to our liking and the truth. And they have none understanding. They have none understanding. They are wise to do evil. It seems like they can pollute everything that is in the natural. They can destroy this earth with their poisons. 
and their habits. But to do good, they have no knowledge. No, none at all. And when the children are so sottish that they can't understand the three earth ages which are so simply put forth from God's Word, it's real sad, dear friend. I could weep for our people because of the standard and level of teaching that is put forth to them in this generation. High technology explodes in this generation. We've placed men on the moon. But what about theology? Where is it? Has it exploded? Verse 23. I beheld the earth, and lo, it was without form and void. There it is. You understand? I told you to remember that word. Tuhu vabuhu. I beheld the earth after that, and it became, it was void and without form in the heavens, and they had no light. I looked after I got through shaking them, and both the heavens and the earth were void and without light. 24. Listen to the destruction after the fall of Satan from your father's own lips. I beheld the mountains, and lo, they trembled. And all the hills moved lightly. Our Father hang this earth in the socket that it fits. It is believed by many that are familiar with the plates of this great earth's crust and surface, surface that all continents were one at one time, and a great shaking caused them to break up. And if you look at the coast of the east coast of the Americas, along with the coast on the west of Africa and Europe, you can see how very possibly those crusts and plates meshed at one time, be that as it may. That's beside the point. God is saying, I shook it. 25. I beheld, I looked, I observed, I saw with my own eyes, your father says. And lo, there was no man... Many of you would like to say, well, this is Noah's flood. No man. Do you know what no means? Zilch. Zero. God destroyed in that body every living being. And they were transformed into a new body instantly. But he destroyed that earth age. Every last man. There were not eight souls floating aboard some ark or other people uh, are uh, alive to, to cater to or to cotton to. No zilch, no man. And all the birds of the heavens are fled. They're destroyed. You have no living bird. What was that that uh, Noah released from the ark? First it was a raven. There were quite a few birds. He had two of those species aboard. Then a dove. Symbolic of peace. This does not have to do with Noah's flood. Listen as we document it. Verse 26. I beheld. This is God again saying, I looked, I saw. And lo, the fruitful place was a wilderness. There was not a tree standing. It was waste. And all... Let, let's stop a minute. What was it that the dove went out to retrieve? Did not at a short end of a year that the dove returned with an olive branch? Do you know how long it takes an olive tree to grow? Do you know how long it takes a branch from waste? Nothing? Quite frankly, if you want to know the truth about it, there was not even a living seed. God created the seed of the olive tree after this event could not have been Noah's flood. You understand? And all the cities thereof. Whoa, what do you know about that, friend? This earth was inhabited with cities at one time before. I'm not talking about the ruins that they find in the Middle East at this time as they go on digs or the mounds of this country. I'm talking about a city that no doubt could have been in a different dimension even. 
as far as substance is concerned, bear with me. Thereof were broken down at the presence of the Lord. What broke them down? Almighty God himself caused them to cease existence. God brought forth a saying that is said in Isaiah, Woe to those that join house unto house. He doesn't like cities. That's why Cain was cursed and became a city dweller and builder. Anytime you start building and joining house unto house, you have murder, rape, crime, and so forth. It extends it when you crowd people together. At the presence of the Lord and by His furious anger. You can understand why that God, when He caused it to simply rain 40 days, He didn't destroy the cities. He did not um, destroy every man for Noah's entire family was aboard the ark. I believe there were people yet in the earth. All God wanted to destroy were the Geber, the giants that were the offspring of woman and the fallen angels, whereby Satan was trying to spoil the woman's seed, whereby the seed of Messiah could not come through woman, else it was part of the serpent's seed. Therefore, Satan still trying to take the mercy seat, if not in the world that was, by hook and crook and, uh, and uh, deception in this world. Do you understand? That's why that it was so important to him that Cain be born of him. For it was through the woman that Messiah would come through this earth age, that office. He doesn't give up. Let that not be a point of digression whereby you miss the point, but rather a, a compound that will solidify the entire truth overall together, for the very controversy is between Christ and Satan. That's why this destruction took place in the beginning. As I have shared with you before, God could have killed a third of his children that followed Satan. But what does it take to cause you to kill one of your own that you love? He, didn't, he chose rather to destroy the age and cause each to be born innocent of woman in the flesh. Innocent with all memory of what was erased. I know this may sound strange to some and no, I'm not talking about reincarnation. Don't be uh, stupid. I'll use the word sottish. Don't be that way. Think. Verse 27, For thus, saith, thus hath the Lord said, The whole land shall be desolate, yet I will not make a full end. I'm going to read one more verse. You may not even have it on your character generator. For this shall the earth mourn, and the heavens above be black, because I have spoken it, I have proposed it, and will not repent, neither will I turn back from it. It's going to happen. Yet I'll leave that remnant, he stated. Now, was the earth, this is what the point hinges on then. It doesn't, it doesn't hinge on it for the Hebrew scholar. The Hebrew manuscripts are very clear. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth then became void and without form because God shook it, and he gave it a good shaking. He destroyed that that was. And that's why, if you want to know the truth about it, that a freeze came over the land, the whole world at one time, I feel quite possibly that God moved the true orbit, the axis of this earth, 90 miles. That's why I think that the North Pole and the Magnetic Pole are 90 miles apart. And therefore, we have the, the uh, jet stream, which forms the weather basically around this globe where at one time it was a perfect climate both at the North and the South Pole because of our situ situ uh, position. But the earth became void and without form and uninhabitable until God cleansed it and corrected it. Do you remember back when we opened in Psalms 104, God spoke and the waters hasted instantly away. That didn't happen in Noah's flood and God promised he would never destroy this earth again. By water. This is the water he's talking about as well as the flood of Noah. But by fire. And he is that consuming fire. So again, the point rests 
in your mind in the English, was the earth created void and without form? Or was it created with the mountain standing out of the water to be inhabited? Do you realize it's written? God makes it very clear. I want to go to the, turn back to the book of Isaiah chapter 45 for me. For one verse. Isaiah chapter 45, verse 18, and let God's word speak for itself. Do not forget the Hebrew word I told you to remember. Tuhu and the severity of it, void. Verse 18, Isaiah 45. For thus saith the Lord, who's speaking? Almighty God, Yahweh. The Lord that created the heavens, God Himself, Himself, that formed the earth and made it. He hath established it, he created, he did what? He created it not in vain. What did that word vain mean? To who? He created it not destroyed. He created it not covered over with black water. Have you got that? Can you understand English? He formed it to be inhabited, not to be wasted, not to be destroyed. Almighty God, your Father, your loving Father, give Him credit. He wouldn't build a wasteland. He created it a beautiful jewel, Mother Earth, to be inhabited. He did not create it to It became that way. Have you got it? I am the Lord. He formed it to be inhabited. I am the Lord and there is none else. He, he's the God of love. What do you think He is? That He would shake these people and destroy them for no cause. Because they had it coming. It is difficult for man to think in God's way. It isn't only difficult, it's impossible. But can you let wisdom rise? The most beautiful proverb, the 8th chapter. Wisdom said, I was with God from the very beginning before He ever created the earth. I was with Him. Wisdom. Can you possess it? Don't be sottish. Listen to His word. And there was a case at one time when Job, Job meaning persecuted in a type of God's elect, I want to go to Job. I want to go to Job. The book of Job. I'm going to go to Job 38. And while you're turning there, I'm going to slip back to the first of Job. And I want to read something to you. You find 38 Job. I'm going to Job 1 verse 7. Just to read it to you. Verse 1, 7 from Job. And the Lord said unto Satan, Whence comest thou? And then Satan answered, I'm sorry, verse 6 I want to read. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. You'll find the same thing written in chapter 2, verse 1. Now, chapter 38 of the book of Job. 37 chapters of Satan accusing Job before God that Satan can deceive him and turn him against God if God will remove all the defenses of Job. God was so proud of Job, even as he is proud of you today. Those that have eyes to see and can understand the simplicity in which his word is written. He said, no, you can't, Satan. You can't win over Job. I'll take down the fence. And Satan cast boils. The poor man was a, a walking dead man. But he never, never gave up. But his three so-called buddy buddies, they tried to make Job perfect, as man will always try to make you. They'll try to make you a real Puritan. They'll try to make you stand up and be a glistening star that never sins. And that's impossible in the flesh. God knows that. 
but yakety, yakety, yakety. And I've heard ministers teach sermons on these first 37 chapters and said, this is the word from God. It is not. Do you know what God thinks about these 37 chapters? Listen to it and learn from your father's word. 38. Then the Lord answered Job. Finally, God speaks after 37 chapters. Out of the whirlwind and said, what is this whirlwind? Is that highly polished bronze whirling disc that is thrown as a board in Ezekiel. Verse 2, Who is this that darkeneth counsel by words without knowledge? In other words, 37 chapters, God says, Why are you listening to those idiots? They don't know what they're talking about, Job. Unfortunately, that's the entire lesson of Job, and that's why I really won't do the thing, all of it on television. I've got it all on cassette tape. And every Christian should experience it once to receive 37 chapters of junk, of men's words, yakety, yakety, yakety. The same thing you get preached from most pulpits in this nation today. It's an experience that you should enjoy. Well, go through. God says, why do you listen to those idiots? You've always got his word, you know. You could listen to your father. Verse 3, Gird up now thy loins like a man, for I will demand of thee and answer thou me. You gird yourself up and get ready for action and service, and you stand up like a man, Job. Verse 4, Where wast thou when I laid the foundations of the earth? If you know so much, Job, if you are so wise in your little flesh, body with its pea brain, where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Declare if thou hast understanding. Stop and think about that one. Where were you? Do you know? Well, I wasn't born yet. Oh, where were you? Verse 5. Who hath laid the measures thereof, if thou knowest? That's a question. Answering. Or who has stretched the line upon it? Who put each star in its place and set the natural law in the order of things? Answering. Naturally, man's got to say, we don't even know how many are really out there, God. And you don't. Six. Upon, whereupon are the foundations thereof fastened? Where are the sockets that hold this earth exactly where it's at? And keeps it in that position. Or who laid the cornerstone thereof? That's all questions. Seven. When the morning stars, listen to me and bear in mind Revelation chapter 12 where Satan drew a third of the stars. That's God's children. It's referring to men. Saying together. I want you to, all the morning stars, the sons of the morning, the sons of God saying together. There wasn't one bad note in the whole lot. What I'm talking about is harmony and peace of mind. And all, how many? Don't you dare miss that point. All the sons of God shouted for joy. Have you heard all the sons of God? Everyone has shouted for joy recently? No, you've always got some group over here that's got some very sad detail that's very grievous to them. But there was a time when all the sons of God... Do you realize that Satan was a son of God? God created him. Ezekiel 28 declares it. He was God's son. He was also one of those that sang with joy. Do you understand what I'm saying? Back in that perfect beginning, before sin entered into that world it was. I'm not talking about this world age. Back when all the sons of God, call them angels if you like, they were simply the souls of people that are inhabit this earth age, passing through one at a time, one time only. Where did your soul come from? It came from God, of course. And you were with Him. All the sons of God, created at the same time, sang for joy because there was happiness there. Job, where were you when that happened? What's Job going to answer? He doesn't know. He doesn't know at all. Or who shut up the sea with doors 
when it break forth as if it had issued out of the womb. Verse 9. When I made the cloud the garment thereof, and thick darkness a swaddling band for it, and break up for it my decree place, I chose my own place, Mount Zion, and set bars and doors, 11, and said, Hitherto shalt thou come, but no further, and here shall thy proud waves be stayed. Set the sea coast, 12, Hast thou commanded the morning since thy days? Have you told it, sun, come up? Job, did you do that? Can you? Do you see how small man is and how unlearned uh, compared to your father? All wisdom comes from our father. And if you don't listen to him, friend, you're sottish. And caused the day spring to know his place. Who put the time clock in its proper uh, sequence? 13, that it might take hold of the ends of the earth, that it could lighten and darken at whichever time, that the wicked might be shaken out of it. Who has the power? Job, can you take the, the wicked one, is what it really says. Can you take hold of this earth and shake the wicked out? God said, I can. I've done it before. 14, it is turned as clay to the seal. And they stand as a garment. A garment for what? A garment for souls. Job, can you take the clay that was level and cause the images to come up from it? First, the man. Can you make a living being from the clay, Job? This is the potter talking to the clay, friend. You got it? And furthermore, Job, not only man, but do you see those images on the horizon, those trees? Can you make them come up, Job? Can you create seed? Need I go on? Our Father, our Father is all-powerful. Poor old Job in chapter 40. I, I can never, I hope that each of you understand Job's place. Job answered in chapter 40. You're not going to have this, but listen to me. Then Job answered the Lord, and the Lord went on and on and showed Job how little man knows if you don't listen to your father. Behold, I am vile, Job says in verse 2 of chapter 40. What shall I answer thee? How can I answer that? I will lay mine hand upon my mouth. I'll close my mouth and put my hand over it so I don't speak foolishly. Once have I spoken, but I will not answer, yea, twice, but I will proceed no further. And then God answered the low Job and he said, You girt yourself up and stand up like a man and stop whimpering before me. You see, you listen to man and you hear a lot of yakety, yakety, yakety. You study in your father's word and you go into the depth of the knowledge of the world that was this earth age and yes, the one that's coming. And the third chapter of Peter jumps to life from the very pages and becomes the living word in your heart and mind and soul. And you begin to realize those three earth ages and why God had to put us in this earth age. And some he chose, yes, even before the foundation of this earth age because they stood against Satan in that first battle. As it is written in Romans chapter 8, they persevered. They were judged there. Therefore God, through the Comforter, can intercede in their lives because they don't even know what to pray for sometimes. But God utilizes His elect to fulfill His prophecy. Prophecy comes to pass exactly as it's written. And do you know why? God is in control and He controls His elect in specific points and places whereby that prophecy comes to pass exactly as it is written. Do you think that you listened to this lecture on the three world ages by accident, dear one? Do you that hear and understand? There would be some that would say, well, he's talking about reincarnation. No, you only go through this earth age one time. Anybody that tells you they are reincarnate or possessed of an evil spirit that possessed someone before and simply prattles on through the mouth of the idiot. 
Well, you're calling all those idiots that claim they're reincarnated. Yeah, that's, that's right. They are. Don't you agree? Anytime you'll let some demonic stay, stay within you, an evil spirit, and spout words unfriendly to you through your own mouth, it pretty well speaks for itself. I don't think I have to make the decision. I think you can figure that out for yourself. Well, there are three worth ages. You must go through each one of them one time and one time only. That's an incorrect statement, and I will correct myself. You must, each will go through the first two one time and one time only. But only the overcomers will go through the third. Because inasmuch as God saw fit that he must kill Satan, and he pronounced a death sentence upon him, saw fit to give each one of those he had misled that opportunity to come through this earth age born of woman. A few refused to be and took woman for play pretty. Remember what happened to them. To make his or her mind up whether they would love God or Satan. And within this brought the Messiah to this earth in the flesh himself. He won't ask you to do something that he won't do himself. All the pain of it. As a matter of fact, he went one step further. He allowed himself to be nailed to that cross through the very palms of his hands. And he did not complain as the sheep led to slaughter. He could have backed out. He could have changed his mind. Many of you think, well, I, I would like to believe that, but I'm, I'm going to wait. I'll change my mind. Yeah. What would have happened if he had changed his mind on you? But he leads some, and he chooses some. But I believe, and don't ask me to document, this is a comment from me, from years of research. I believe one of the reasons that God came in that body of Messiah and died upon the cross is clearly stated in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14. I came to this earth to be crucified whereby I can destroy Satan, the devil, which is death. In other words, I ask, what does it take to kill one of your own children? God saw fit to come here in the form of Messiah, to die at the hands of the Kenite, which is to say the offspring of Satan, Satan egging them on. They killed him, therefore the parable the father sent the son to those that the field had been let out to, the vineyard rather. And they killed him to try to inherit. Satan wants to inherit. And now inasmuch as Satan killed the body of God in Christ, in flesh, God won't have to worry too much. Or I imagine his conscience and his loving self will not feel so bad when he ducks Satan's curly locks under the burning brine in the lake of fire and those that choose to follow him. Bless your hearts. I hope you have understood this. I hope you've enjoyed it. Our Father's knowledge is written in his word. It's up to you to ascertain that that you will that brings you peace of mind and understanding in the events that happen in this earth age and realize how important it is then that you serve him. There's really nothing else that's quite as important. And the faithful love of our close-knit family, with he being our father that looks out for us and brings those blessings. Yes? If someone asks you again as a Christian, how old do you think this earth is? Don't say 6,000 years. Say eons. Millions of years. It's been documented. All right, bless your heart. You listen a moment, please. Good day to you. God bless you. Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour. Praise God for His Word. We just thank Him for this great nation that gives us the right and the privilege to gather together. How precious she is. And we just praise God for her and the many blessings for indeed He does bless America. So we thank him for his word and we ask that he be with us in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Okay, on completion of the book of Ecclesiastes, rather than starting another book, I thought we would do a little exercise this evening. Well, call it whatever you like. Not a test, 
but an example of how you put knowledge and wisdom gain from that book of wisdom to work in God's Word. Let's take one specific subject, if we may. That was covered a great deal, and as much as Ecclesiastes was written to the flesh man and how your soul, the inner man, should control and make that flesh body work for you. Then we found that the flesh goes into the ground, and there it is evermore, dust to dust, ashes to ashes. But the spirit, which is the intellect of the soul, returns instantly to the Father that gave it, meaning that we have a God of the living, not a God of the dead. Now, to apply that then, I want to go through some New Testament scriptures to show you how that the knowledge of God's written word, which is to say the Old Testament, can make the New Testament spring to life for you. You can have a better understanding. As an example, again, we're focusing from Ecclesiastes on, um, call it life after death of the flesh, not life after death, for no one dies. They go instantly to the Father from whence they came. We covered that in the 12th chapter. But to understand that, then they take on that angelic body, which is to say simply your spiritual body, as it is taught in Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. So I want you to turn with me, if you would, in the book of Matthew. You're not going to have these on your screen, but it'll be good for you to get a little exercise in the Word of God. Matthew chapter 22. You'll remember we covered Matthew not long ago. But I want you to note how, how this um, study in Ecclesiastes um, um, helps your understanding in all of God's teachings. It is precious the way the scriptures fit neatly together. No man can cross them and let God's overall purpose and plan flow. You'll remember, I'll set the stage to you for you here in chapter 22 of the book of Matthew, the Sadducees were trying to trip Christ up, for the Sadducees did not believe in life after death of the flesh. All right? So they were trying to trip him up. He said, hey, there was a lady that was married to seven brothers. They all died. Now which will she be married to in the eternity or when you are raised? All right? Jesus then, in the 29th verse of this 22nd chapter, answers. Now, I want you to see how the book of Ecclesiastes helps you to understand the scripture, the teachings of Jesus. 29, Jesus answered and said unto them, Ye do err, not knowing the scriptures, nor the power of God. In other words, because they did not know the book of Ecclesiastes. That's the scripture he's speaking of. You err. That's why Jesus, when asked a question, he said, haven't you ever read it? It's written. And that's why I'm taking advantage of our knowledge just gained from the book of Ecclesiastes to show how it, uh, how it complements the New Testament or any teaching as far as that's concerned. Jesus first telling them, if you knew the scriptures, you would not ask that. Listen closely. 30, for in the resurrection they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels of God in heaven. In other words, they are in that spiritual body. Which is what? That's the body that the angels are in. How perfect the plan of God. <clears throat> Your knowledge from the book of Ecclesiastes helps you a great deal there because you knew and understood the flesh that we read of in the last lecture, how that it grows old, it loses its passions, it loses its teeth, its hair falls out, our bones get frail and fragile, we become afraid of heights, we grow hard of hearing, and our sight grows dim in old age. Letting you know you're not losing a whole lot when you put that aside and step into that beautiful uh, spiritual body. 
that knows no pain. The word in the Greek is uh, incorruptible. It means incapable of, of uh, disease, sickness, aging, etc. What a body to be in. That's the one that Christ prepared for you, your mansion, your habitation for the eternity if uh, your soul is transferred into that new body in an eternal sense, which is to say this mortal being must put on immortality, soul-wise, uh, not only body-wise. So then we begin to see in this, listen to Jesus now, verse 31. But as touching the resurrection of the dead, as touching where those dead are and when they are raised, have ye not read that which was spoken unto you by God, saying, in other words, this is the scripture, haven't you read it? Verse 32, I am, there's the sacred name, I am the God of Abraham, and the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. I am not the God of those ashes or that dust that that flesh body turned back into. I'm the creator of the erats, the terra firma, the soil, the clay. He was the creator of that, but he's the father of the soul. A much more personal, a much more touching, loving, approach with to your relationship with Almighty God. You see, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob were with him. They were not dead. They were not in the ground. They were living. And so we see then, we can better understand what Jesus was talking about. We do not marry nor give in marriage in that body. Why? There will be no children born. No children born whatsoever. Why then were children to be born in this earth age? That was God's way of allowing each soul to enter. Therefore he created woman and the womb. Whereby those children could enter into this earth age. You know, Paul taught a great deal as well concerning where the dead are with the thought and in mind from Ecclesiastes, so fresh. I want you to turn with me to 1 Thessalonians. We're going to understand a, an in-depth teaching that is so often misquoted and used uh, for the resurrection, the rapture, the lifting out, or whatever, because of the ignorance of men. They are ignorant of the truth. Some of them would even tell you that your relatives are out here under the sod. What kind of God would we have if our relatives were out here under the sod? Does he have the ability to give life or not? Of course, he's the God of living. He is not the God of the dead. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, let's pick it up in verse 13. And I want you to see specifically what Paul is is talking about what he is addressing. And I want you to see what man has turned it into. I think the knowledge just gained from Ecclesiastes will give you a new light, many of you. Chapter, thir chapter 4 of 1 Thessalonians, verse 13, and it reads, But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren. Do you understand what that means? I don't want you to be ignorant concerning them that are asleep. I don't want you to be ignorant about the dead. That ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. In other words, you got a bunch of heathen out there that don't know we serve a living God, running around worshiping idols, and they weep uh, for the dead. Oh, it's all right to weep for sorrow of losing a loved one. But at the same time, find a little spot in your heart to rejoice because they've gathered back to God, as you learned in Ecclesiastes. Now, Greek is very specific. What is Paul addressing here? Where those are that sleep, and concerning the resurrection. 
He doesn't want you to be ignorant about it. What is he going to draw from? The Old Testament. It is written. He wants you to draw from it. Verse 14. Let's see if it falls in place better for you now than perhaps ever before. 14. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again. Now hold it right there. Do you or don't you? Well, every Christian believes that. Then I don't really see any big hang up. If they, if they believe that, then what? Even so, then also. I want to, now stop there a moment. Them also. Not just Christ alone rose from the dead. Them also. Which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. How can he bring them with him? If they're out here under the clods. In the mire. He can't. Therefore, as it is written, they go instantly, the soul, to him, and the dust returns back to dust for an eternity, forever. What he's telling you there, my dear one, is that if you believe Jesus rose out of that tomb, you better believe that everybody that dies does. Or you're really not a believer. You're not a Christian. If you don't believe that your relatives in Christ and are otherwise, they all do. Sinners and saints. They all raise there for judgment when that judgment time comes. For God is not the God uh, of the dead, but the living. Do you think for a moment that Almighty God, with the love in His heart, would allow a scoundrel like Satan to run in heaven? To be in heaven? It's documented, Revelation chapter 12, that he is there along with the book of Job chapters 1 and 2. Do you think God would allow Satan to be in heaven and be so hard on your innocent ancestors and those passed on that he would leave them out here under the rocks? The clods in some miserable box. Box is for the flesh. God is for the living. What Paul has said, very simply, he's not talking about a rapture. He's talking about where the dead are. And he doesn't want you to be ignorant about it. They're with God. If you believe Jesus is there, and as it is recorded, he's at the right hand of God, then you better believe the others are there. Because that's what he paid the price for. Otherwise, you teach and practice a dead religion. That's Satanism. You either believe God's word or you don't. Now, I want to, again, I want you to see how rewarding the book of Ecclesiastes is in understanding what Paul is saying here. He will bring them with him. As it is written in Revelation chapter 6, John was taken in the year... Uh, 60 A.D., let's say, give or take a few years. And he was showing all those that were under the altar, even to the Lord's day before the seventh trump. They were already there. They had washed their robes in the blood of the Lamb and were singing praises. They, they were, you couldn't count them. They were there. Those that had shed their blood, even if you would, for the name of Jesus, uh, the martyrs, talking, being understood, they were present. My dear friend, believe me, you serve a living God and a God of the living, not a God of the dead. Never listen to anyone that will try to teach a ministry of death, for it is bondage, death being that bondage. Verse 15, for this we say unto you by the word of the, by the word of the Lord, comma, hold it right there. What word? Right in Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 7. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord. 
that we which are alive, we that are in this, remember the live dogs better than a dead lion? We that walk under this sun? We that are in the flesh and the flesh lives? And remain, that means on earth, unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. There's no way that any of we that are living can prevent. The word in the Greek is proceed. We can in no way proceed those that are already dead. Why? If you listen to the word of God, you know why that we that are living and remain into the coming of the Lord cannot proceed the dead because they're already there. It's that simple. They're already there. How precious it is that Paul says, as taught by the word of the Lord. That's why it's so important that we study his word, beloved, so that we grow. And we take the wisdom of Solomon and others, all wisdom coming from God, and grow into his truth and the simplicity rather than listening to the nonsense that some men pound and teach from pulpits. You see, they don't know what they're talking about when they counter the word of God. And it's quite easy for you to understand when they know what they're talking about and when they don't. If they don't, get rid of them. And whatever you do, don't support them. For you're supporting a work of Satan and ignorance. Verse 16. Uh, what I'm saying is don't expect... You, you can support them if you want to, but don't expect God to bless you for helping Satan's work. Satan will bless you for it, but God won't. Alright? Is that quite clear? Verse 16. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, that is the last trump, the seventh trump, which sounds when the two witnesses rise from the street, the seventh trump and last trump not sounded, which is God's trump as it's well illustrated in the book of Revelation. Until those two witnesses rise from the street and fear comes over those that worshiped Antichrist, thinking he was Christ come to rapture them away. At this trump, the trump of God, colon, I want you to note, colon, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. What is the subject? The dead do rise first. Why? They're already risen. If you believe Christ rose, you must believe they rose also. They are with Him. The Greek is very specific in it, though the translation has enough uh, uh, thought that the weak fall by the wayside. But wisdom from the Lord's Word allows your mind to keep the thought in context and the truth flows smoothly for the God, our Father does not say one thing out of one side of His mouth and something else out of the other. For example, the Old or the New Testament. They must align. They must complement each other or you're not understanding the Word of God. Verse 17. As you probably recognize, this is where most people get the rapture theory, but that's not what Paul's talking about. Paul's talking about where the dead are. Not some flyaway goony bird story. 17. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Now, this word air in the Greek, er, is not the word sky. Do you know what it is? It's breath of life. We'll meet them in that new spiritual body. The body that Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 that we will all instantly be changed into. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Now, Paul spoke colloquial Greek. He was educated in Hebrew. 
under Gamiel, at his feet, the greatest of Hebrew scholars. He spoke colloquial Greek, which is to say, as much as he moved around, he picked up many words. In other words, understand what I'm saying. He was not educated in the Greek language. He only spoke that that he heard. He was educated in Hebrew. Therefore, he uses figures of speech, idioms, and so forth. I want you to just hold your place there and turn with me over into the book of Hebrews to show you some of Paul's style. You can't miss it if you understand the manuscripts. His thumbprints are on it. Because whichever area he moves to, he picks up their speech. As in Arkansas, here you might walk on the street and down the street here and you would hear someone say, Yunz has come over and see us this weekend. Whereas if you were up north, well, I don't know what they say up north, but uh, they probably say, you all come. Or, no, I'm sure they don't do that. Probably they say, come over, or something to that effect. Do you understand what I'm saying? Different areas have different ways of saying things. Together in a cloud, it's, you say, look at that cloud of locust. It's a figure of speech. To Paul, it meant together in a crowd. Chapter 12, the book of Hebrews, verse 1, Paul the writer. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses... A cloud of what? A cloud of witnesses. That means a large group. Let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before of us. For us, Let us gather in a cloud and run this foot race. We have work to do on this earth in the millennium. Christ is coming here. Nobody's flying off anywhere but Christ's own will gather in a large assembly, a cloud, if you wish, around Him, with Him, and we shall be in that spiritual body. Those of you with strong concordances to take the sledgehammer and knock in the head the rapture theory for the final time in your mind, I want you to quite simply look up that word air in your strong concordance, and it will say breath of life. Then I want you to do me a favor, and I want you to look up the word sky in your Strong's Concordance. You understand? Sky. And you'll find it's a totally different word. and has nothing to do with the breath of life. What Paul is saying is he is reiterating his teachings of 1 Corinthians chapter 15, that we will all that not sleep instantly in a twinkle of an eye change into this beautiful body of the breath of life, that spiritual body, and be with the Lord forever if you overcome. Verse 18, Wherefore comfort one another with these words. Comfort them how? Comfort those that lose a loved one. That's what he's talking about, not some goony bird fly away feather duster story. But comfort your neighbor when they lose a loved one. Rather than some goony bird preacher running over and saying, Don't worry, honey, they'll be safe there under the ground. They're dead. Your pastor has consoled you. We don't know whether they've gone to heaven or hell. They're dead. God is the God of dead. That'd really lift you up, wouldn't it? Hmm? And really make your day. No. God is the God of living. No, don't you be ignorant of where the dead are, whereby you can comfort one another with these words. Words that address where they are. And yes, bless your hearts, when we shall join them. You see, the word resurrection, you might as well look it up in your Strong's while you're at it, too, in the Greek, and find out that it has three meanings, whereby you can educate yourself a little better into receiving God's Word. It is written, and so it shall stand. You know, what do you do and what must you do? Well, did Paul know what he was talking about? Well, a lot of Goonie birds misunderstood his first letter, so he wrote a second one. He rushed it because Silas and Timothy were still there. They weren't there very long, 
So he hastened this second letter to them. Turn to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 while we're there. He's talking to the same group of people that he, that you, if some would interpret Goonie Bird fly away to. He's telling that same identical group of people they misunderstood him. And this is how they're going to meet the Lord. Do you understand? Can you follow that? He is talking to the same people, only they messed their own minds up. Listen closely. Chapter 2, verse 2. I'm sorry, chapter, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto Him. I want to talk to this group about Christ returning here and our gathering back to Him. Is that difficult? He doesn't want you to be ignorant about this either. He's talking to you about our gathering back to Christ, period. All right? He said, I, I, I want you to know that's what we're going to talk about. Verse 2, that you be not soon shaken in mind. Don't let somebody get the egg beater in your skull and mix your mind up with this death stuff. All right? Or be troubled neither by spirit nor by word. Don't you let some preacher teaching the word of God twist it nor by letter as from us. Don't you let that first letter to you Thessalonians where I was talking about gathering in a cloud confuse you as that the day of Christ is at hand, that you're going to rapture away. Understand he's writing a same letter, or rather he's writing a second letter to the same people he wrote the first letter to. Well, I heard there were two Greek. No, there's just one group. God only has one set of children. Many tribes, many races, but one set of children. Verse 3. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except there come a falling away. That's apostasy. Many people deceived. Many people confused. And that man of sin be revealed. That's Apalia, which is to one of Satan's name. It is Satan, the son of perdition, Apalia. Don't, hey, don't let some preacher deceive you, friend. Christ is not going to gather back to us until after the son of perdition does what? Appears here and deceives the world. Four, who opposeth and exalteth, exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worship, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. In other words, playing Savior. Don't worry, nobody's going to make any flyaway trips before this happens. Paul's writing to the same people. You know, people get hooked up on the fairy tale that started 150 years ago, and they can't come off of it. They've got to have some man-made tradition that is their security blanket. And they title and cuddle them little selves up in it, and they're going to worship Antichrist. It's like an idol worship. Does that sound hard? Friend, it's serious, worshiping devil. Worshiping Satan as Antichrist is very serious. Verse 5, Remember ye not that when I was with you, I told you these things. I told you all about it. I went into detail. And now you know what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time. Who? You can't stick something into the Greek. A lot of ill-advised non-scholars would tell you this is the church. They are not scholars. They know not what they speak of. The verb is transitive. Greek is specific. It's talking about that same Antichrist and Michael that prevents him. Michael prevents him from what? Remaining in heaven for one thing, but also having free run of this earth. He's in prison assigned to Michael in heaven. But when Michael's ready, and you can read that account in Revelation chapter 12, out he comes to this earth. For the mystery of inequity doth already work, only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. That is Michael, and then Satan's going to be booted out, and then shall that wicked be revealed. He'll be here, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth. All right, you got it? The Lord, when? When... 
and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. The Lord comes after him. <clears throat> now, you might say, well, why make such a big thing out of this? Well, it's it, it worship Satan if you want to. If you believe the rapture theory, you shall absolutely, I can guarantee you, 100%, if you don't change your mind, you will worship Satan. Antichrist, which is to say instead of Christ. It's not some human being that some spirit moves into and a man shows his ignorance when he teaches such trot. Satan himself is the son of perdition. God's word makes it very clear. How man likes to play church. God's word, I prefer it. It's strong, yes, but it's very specific. Well, now we were in the Old Testament. Now you've come to the New Testament. It doesn't talk anything about that back in the Old Testament. Oh, it doesn't? That's the point I'm trying to teach you. Turn with me real quickly in closing to Isaiah. The book of Isaiah, chapter 25. Turn there with me. God's Word will stand up. You don't have to worry about it. Never apologize for it. A man might have to apologize for his ignorance and what he teaches concerning rapture, but God's Word doesn't teach it, nor will it ever have to apologize for it. This is the return of Almighty God to this earth as He establishes His kingdom in Isaiah chapter 25 in the Old Testament. And we pick it up in verse 7 of that 25th chapter for the sake of time. And he will destroy in his mountain, that's the nation, the face of the covering cast over all people and the veil that is spread over all nations. That's the veil of the big lie. Remember we read of it in Ezekiel chapter 13 where the rapture theory threw the veil over the saving arms of God and they led people to hell by teaching them to fly to fly away to save their souls. That's Satan talk. It's the teachings of the devil. He says, I'm going to rip that lie and deception away from them, as well as he will remove his own stupa, Romans chapter 11, that he placed upon them. Eight. He will swallow up death in victory. And the Lord God will wipe away tears from off all faces. And the rebuke of his people shall be taken away. Shall he take away from off all the earth. For the Lord hath spoken it. He's going to return. He's going to take away that rebuke. Destroy death. How? Christ did it. The Godhead. Paid the price on the cross. Death, where is your sting? Christ paid the price to raise the dead. They're with him. Don't teach they're in the ground. They're free. So stop teaching bondage. Verse 9. And it shall be said in that day, Lo, this is our God. We have waited for him. We didn't fall for funny bunny when he showed up on the scene. That's to say the son of perdition. You see, it's taught in the Old Testament. We waited for the true God. We didn't get in that veil of fuddy-duddy, fly-away, goony-bird talk. And He will save us. This is the Lord. We have waited for Him, not the Antichrist. We will be glad and rejoice in His salvation. You see, God wants you to wait for him. That's why Jesus in another figure of speech said, Woe to those that are with child when I return. Those that give suck. Well, how can Jesus turn against the fa Matthew chapter 24, Mark 13, if you want documentation. How could Christ teach against childbearing when we were instructed from the very garden, go forth and replenish the earth? It's honorable to bear children. And for them him finally to say, Woe to the woman that is with child when I return. You see, he was speaking in a spiritual sense, beloved. He is the husband, and you are to be a virgin when he returns. 
If a husband has been away for 2,000 years and returns, pregnancy is nine months in whichever dispensation it was. It's all the same for the human being. It would have meant that nine months prior, prior or, or more recent, she had, she had um, taken on a false lover. He knows there will be a wedding before the true wedding. See that you are the part of the five that keep their wicks trimmed and wait for the Lord. As Paul taught in 2 Thessalonians, it, don't let any man deceive you. Christ will not return to this earth until after Antichrist stands in Jerusalem claiming to be Jesus, uh, claiming to be God. If you choose to listen to man rather than the word of God, then you choose your own lot and you shall wallow in it. We are in the last days. They are soon upon us. I wanted to discuss this because Ecclesiastes gives you the foundation in wisdom to know where the dead are. It brings those scriptures in the New Testament to life. And it gives you the fulfillment to know God loves his children. He doesn't have them in little vials of dust. He has those beautiful bodies. As Paul said also in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, I would not have you ignorant for that that dies... Uh, is not the same as comes up. That beautiful body that goes back to the Father. Well, I hope you've enjoyed this. Bless your hearts. Listen a moment. I want to share something with you.